Kultashal has three Jaguar squadrons, of, of which six is the oldest. Uh, our operations are threefold, offensive support, air interdiction and reconnaissance. In brief, offensive support are operations uh, directly in support of the army, of the land forces. Air interdiction missions tend to be ones of those, again, in support of land operations, but a long way behind enemy lines. And reconnaissance is as required on the battlefield or beyond in support of the land or air commanders. Our operations at Foltershall are deployment based. The Jaguar is an aircraft that is designed to deploy and fight away from Coltishall. We, we don't plan to stay at Coltishall in support of any operations. To that end, in recent years, we've been involved in three major operations. The first one being Operation Granby, where as part of coalition forces, the Jaguars were involved in removing Saddam, uh, Saddam's forces from Kuwait. Here the Jaguars flew 617 operational missions without loss, again with great success, removing Saddam's army or helping remove Saddam's army from Kuwait. The second recent operation that we got involved in was one operating from Incilic in Turkey, where again part of a coalition force, we helped uh, support the Kurds in northern Iraq. Just two months after that, the Jaguars are yet again on operations, this time on Operation Deny Flight, as we call it, which was supporting UN troops on the ground over Bosnia Herzegovina. That means for almost five years continuously, the Kultashal Jaguars and Six Squadron specifically have been on continuous operations. The period of two weeks for spending up here at uh, Lukers is to fine tune and fine hone our uh, skills basically in two areas. Firstly, operational low flying, which is low flying below our normal 250 feet minimum limit, and also to drop heavy weapons, real live weapons, on the only range available to us in the UK currently, uh, Garvey Island in the northwest of Scotland. 
to conduct an exercise like we're doing at the moment uh, here in Scotland, they need to have a minimum of 250 hours on their airplane until that uh, milestone is reached. They're not allowed to participate, they're not all authorised to participate in this operational low flying. So yes, yeah, it's not open to all of the squadron, but to the majority, some 15 out of my 17 pilots are operating here with us now, fine-tuning the schools before we go to the Middle East later in the year to conduct a combined exercise with a Middle East country. A typical exercise, uh, for instance, with the Middle East country that we're doing with coming up, would involve uh, four, six or eight Jaguars flying as bombers. They would be supported by host country fighters acting both against us and with us to protect us. So we do normal low-level navigation, live weaponeering, uh, some uh, air combat perhaps with the uh, host country, uh, perhaps some reconnaissance. So it's a, it's a difficult, mixed exercise, challenging. For this trip, we've actually used six four-ton vehicles and two 40-foot trailer vehicles full of equipment. We've had to drive up all our own MT to support us whilst we're away. We have no supply chain, regular supply route. We have to take all our own DOL, oil, uh, weapons, and other consumables away with us. Whilst we're here at Lucas, it's unique in that we're working in a has environment. Back at home, we only work on the line where all our manpower and equipment is centralized in one area. Here, we're spread around a, a mile square site. We're then working, having to lift heavy load, where we need at least four people, and we're working with pneumatics and hydraulics and general engineering ground equipment. Each sortie, not just those on which a live weapon is dropped, ends with a thorough debrief. During the debrief, every aspect of the flight and the weaponeering is analysed and commented upon. And also, uh, just generally, uh, flying probably a little bit too fast. I managed to get a CIP uh, solution, but I had bank on, and it would have been a, you know, a damage at the most, yeah. certainly not a hit. And as you can see, yeah. You have to pop. I mean, 600 feet, having been at 100 feet, so it's awfully, awfully high. Off target, you went straight ahead. I ended up uh, having to jink off left. I didn't hear you click, so I assumed that I had to fly the entire plan. I didn't quite go to the coast, and I ended up running a little bit early. You called blind on me. I just popped the hike up a little bit. You're in good battle on me there, but again, uh, we seem to turn and end up a little bit early.
One month later, the squadron leave for their Middle Eastern destination. The flight, completed with the support of VC-10 tankers from 101 Squadron Bryce Norton, takes a total of 12 hours. Five hours spent en route to an overnight stop in Suda Bay Crete, and then, the next day, a further seven hours onto their final destination. With the final refueling completed, the Jaguars leave their tankers behind. The following two weeks are spent low-flying over stunning Middle Eastern landscapes.
An essential element in the successful performance of an attack squadron is its ability to deliver weapons accurately onto the target. To focus their weaponeering skills, the squadron deploys to RAF Deci Mamanu, Sardinia. Deci is also the home to the Italian and German air forces, flying starfighters and tornadoes. It's an intensive period of weaponry training. Um, it's good for a squadron and pilots to do this at least once a year. Um, and it's good for the pilots and for the aircraft as well, because we get the pilots back up to speed at all weapon events, which is our bread and butter job. Um, and we also get the jets up to speed and get them harmonized. I mean, this is, as, at the end of this exercise, the jets will be as well harmonized as they, as they are in a year. And it, they'll, they'll stray away from that as time goes on. But it's a, it's a time to, to, to hone up your weaponry skills, which is the important part, because there's no point fighting your way through the, through the flot, um, defeating the air risk, getting there, and then missing the target by 200 feet. You've wasted the day. So this is very important stuff. Uh, not normal, no, not for uh, RAF conditions. Uh, perhaps a typical uh, Italian condition. This is a temporary tower at the moment. Uh, usually we're on the, uh, as you can see, the one out the back there, the, uh, the main tower. Um, unfortunately, that's uh, got communications problems and it basically needs rewiring. So uh, we've had to move into here for, uh, throughout the detachment. And uh, as you can see, <laughs> not ideal, but it does work. It does the job. Every sortie is preceded by the brief. Given by the formation leader, it is a thorough walkthrough of all that will occur during the flight. All aspects of timing, procedures and weaponeering are discussed. Finally, assurance is gained by the leader that none of his formation have any doubts over their duties or responsibilities during the impending sortie. Having up, so you'll be the, your first FRA against each other levels uh, three degrees against each other for that, and five over for the strike. We are London, it's me, Muskie, the boss, and Sharpie, Echo Juliet, Fox Mike, Fox Alpha, and Golf Papa. We've got Fox Delta as a spare. Please check uh, how many jets are bombing from the boards, please, and, uh, and don't forget to fill those in when we get back. Patterns, all left-hand patterns today, a thousand feet for the level. I suggest you smidge it up a bit for the three degrees to make it look more like at home, um, and certainly if you're flying uh, a relatively slack pattern turning and beating the headland and you're going to need a slightly higher, about 1200 feet of tip in um, to make the picture look right and to get uh, a good 3 degree attack uh, releasing at 250. It's good. Okay, so to summarise, it's LIMAC, so only one dry. Let's have some good bombs and guns. Please interrogate what you've done wrong on that previous pass on your next pass so we make an improvement throughout the, uh, throughout the sortie and it's uh, 200 lira per bomb and 500 lira for the straight. Any questions? Must boss, you, shall be. Okay, let's go. You should be banned from the competition. Nice to you. Must be benefit. This is good. Uh, range, it's out of spot. For range detail, I know what you're doing. You're doing a four, which is a limac low level. <coughs> Attack on the straight bombs. Briefed. Please.
I would say this one, this particular detachment is, uh, is, is slightly different in that respect in that because it's, we're here to practice bombing and strafing and you can actually see tangible results at the, uh, the end of every mission, you can look at it and, and, and we've got a score sheet and you can see who's, who's winning the bombing and who's winning the strafing. And, and so to that end, I think this is one, perhaps one of the more competitive I against each other uh, detachments that I've been on. I think we're all competitive by nature. I think it's inherent in the character of the man chosen uh, to fly fast jets. And, uh, it, but it never really, it never gets to the point where it becomes a problem or people are overly competitive to the point where it causes arguments or disagreements. I think it's all generally fairly good natured. The exercise is now underway and the Jaguars in the company of F-16s taxi out for the first of many sorties. While at Dechimamanu, the American F-16s and German Tornado GR-1s share the allocation of range slots with the Jaguars of 6th Squadron. It is the beginning of a long week for 6th Squadron. As the pilots begin their range sorties, they are acutely aware that each score, be it a bomb or a bullet, is recorded against their name. These scores are averaged and then displayed for everyone to see. There is nowhere to hide following a poor performance, whether it be the individual's or the aircraft's fault. And it's only an active light airplane slot, the range detail, I know what you're doing, you're doing that sort of four straight over wing pylons, accounted for in the brief, yeah. so don't know the stress to the plane. Attack maneuver, straight from bombs, brief, and what you said it is. Uh, it's the Ultra again. Ultra, yeah, just uh, picked off just as I wound up on the end of the end. Um, tried a couple of resets, didn't work, so I came back, went back up to 885, tried a couple of other resets, so that didn't work. Taxi back in. How did it make you feel then? A bit frustrated. Sort of uh, last at one trip, quite psyched up for it. Get out there and uh, the jet brakes, so. Unservice abilities will result in long hours for the squadron's team of dedicated engineers. To prepare for the next day, they will often work long into the night, working on the squadron's allocation of aircraft. Sadly, this allocation is no longer solely in six squadron markings. Each of Coltishaw's three squadrons are better served sharing its aircraft, both at home and overseas. It was uh, number three of a four ship, uh, going off to do trip number eight to the range and uh, had a normal engine start. Went out to the uh, ORP just uh, before we lined up on the runway and everything was fine, just waiting to, for the time to take off. And uh, once I got onto the runway and wound the engines up, I had a, an Alt-2 caption, which they've, they've had a snag with this jet before with that, that problem. So uh, I tried resetting it. You allowed two re re attempts uh, at 100% and that didn't work, so I had to uh, try another couple at 85% to reduce loading on it. And, uh, that didn't work either, so I had to taxi back, unfortunately, and shut down the jet, so I lost the trip there. Thankfully, um, being down to absolutely no aircraft doesn't happen that often. In actual fact, my time on Jaguar, I don't think I've ever known a time that that has happened. Um, it's one of those things. It does put an extreme amount of pressure on the ground crew. There's a lot of running around, and, and I was trying to get jets into the air. Um, the time out here is obviously very valuable, and valuable for the air crew to try and get their, their skills and and scores um, up to standard. Uh, so it, it does cause us a lot of running around and we, we try our best to try and get them serviceable to meet the range slot, but really we are tied by that range slot. If it be that an aircraft is unserviceable for, for an hour, then it's unserviceable for an hour and whether we get it up is quite irrelevant. If the slot is missed, it's missed and the aircraft doesn't go flying. The activity you see around here is the results of a particularly difficult day in terms of uh, aircraft faults and 
one that's not typical of Jaguar serviceability across the whole, but can, you can occasionally have days where aeroplanes won't play the game and you end up with lots of faults. We've got aeroplanes in here uh, because as a result of uh, the discovery of loose articles in the cockpits, which necessitates the removal of the uh, seats. We've got aeroplanes in here that have had undercarriage uh, problems in flight, which necess necessitates the aircraft going onto aircraft jacks. And our uh, airframe technicians actually going through all of the system to make sure that the system functions well. First of all, to fault diagnose with the system, to find the fault, and then to put it right, and then to functionally check that all of the work that they've done has, uh, um, or will ensure that the integrity of the system is uh, maintained. Plans are afoot as the squadron's Mission Impossible team set out to leave their mark on Dechi Mamanu. The stenciled number six is carefully cut out as preparations are made to place the six on a 100-foot water tower in clear view of all visiting squadrons and locals alike. The squadron are now away from Coltishaw for the fourth time in 12 months, and with the exercise now moving into the second week, the pilots bide their time in between flights, talking about earlier range results and thoughts of family and friends back at home. Last night we saw you getting a bit of banter from the lads and you were obviously um, not too phased by it. Is that something that you've found a problem over here or is it very much the same very, at home? Uh, it's a very English thing, the banter. We don't, we don't do that, but we don't do it to, to the level here. And it it uh, knocks you back initially when you first get to the UK, but you get used to it. And it, I can give as good as I get, so I'm learning. You feel, you go through a number of emotions. Um, you go through the guilt of being in better weather, often. Um, the guilt of being on a you know, sunny beach, windsurfing, um, water skiing occasionally at, at weekends. Um, you go through the frustration of being separated from your family, particularly obviously as they grow up. and you. You can't pick and choose the exercises that you uh, and the detachments that you go on. So invariably, there will be clashes with um, children's birthdays, uh, wife's birthdays, wedding anniversaries. Um, it's all part and parcel of the of the job. Unfortunately, um, you have to have a family that appreciate what's involved. You have to have a, a strong wife that grits her teeth and uh, gets on with it. Really.
tradition which goes back as long as anybody can remember in the Air Force, I think, which is that wherever we go, if it's to a major uh, exercise area that RAF squadrons go to every year, we tend to leave a squadron mark or a squadron emblem. And for Sixth Squadron, this is, as we're called, the Flying Can Openers, a name that dates back to the First World War, doing a bit of tank busting. Sixth Squadron uh, emblem is, in fact, the can opener with our jet, the Jaguar, right in the middle. So we thought, what better emblem to leave in Detchi than uh, the Flying Can Opener symbol? So here it is. Yeah, there's a pretty good buccaneer which is uh, good to see, very large buccaneer picture over there in black and white, which is excellent because the buccaneer is now long since gone out of the RAF's inventory. So it's good to see an aeroplane there that uh, we don't see flying anymore. There's an excellent 74 Squadron Tiger, which is worth having a look at if you haven't already seen it. Um, 74 tend to paint tigers wherever they go, tigers on everything. We're out here on what's called an armament practice camp, which is an APC. It's uh, essentially to, uh, to use the, the bombing range, which is just near Dechi Mamanu, uh, to practice our low angle and high angle bombing, and also strafe. And we use practice weapons to uh, simulate real weapons that we would deliver, and, uh, and also practice uh, bullets to simulate uh, real high explosive bullets. There's also a secondary aim in as much that we have to try and harmonise the aircraft to, uh, to try and get them bombing as accurately as possible. Because within the aircraft is an is a inertial navigation system which assists us with bombing, but uh, it's only as good as its uh, harmonisation. So we also come out here to try and uh, to perfect that on the aircraft and make sure they're bombing where we're, uh, uh, we're asking them to bomb. It's basically a last minute check for the pilot's confidence check on the state of the aircraft. Um, the lineys have been at it probably for hours before we even get near it, doing the um, before flight maintenance or a turnaround maintenance on the aircraft. So it's already been crawled over thoroughly, but it's just a last minute check of the pilot, just double check things you have to look at. You start off by going in the cockpit um, and you do basic safety checks on the seat, take all the pins out, start to make the seat live. Then you go around the cockpit turning whatever needs to be turned on. Uh, some of the equipment needs a couple of minutes warm up time. Then you go back down the ladder and just go round the jet, starting off, and one of the most critical things, especially out here on a bombing range, is to go up underneath the nose bay and check the, the AMU weapon switches. Um, that's what tells the aircraft what it's got on the pylons, and that affects the ballistics. Um, and you can be in an embarrassing situation if you've got the wrong thing set up in the little black box in the nose wheel bay, then the wrong thing will fall off the jet. And we've had instances of, uh, instead of the practice bomb falling off, the entire CBLS will come off. So that's an important check. And then you just roam around the aircraft looking for things that are out of order, leaks. Um, you're checking the tires are in good condition. Um, and you're just checking all the stores are secure on the aircraft. And just looking around for anything. Um, bird strike damage can sometimes be missed. Uh, and just in a last minute confidence check, pulling all the pins out as well, which is usually done by the lady as the pilot approaches the jet. Um, and then you're off in, strapped in, start up. Kick the tires like the fires. As the chief sweatmeister on the squadron, I can confirm that these conditions are, as you can see, are very, very hard work. Uh, once you've got the full kit on, you've got about two layers of cotton, and then you've got endless layers of plastic to go over the top of it. It gets very, very hot, especially the Jaguar, where when we taxi, we can't put air conditioning on until once we're airborne uh, because of the lack of thrust in these hot conditions. So we sweat to death, and uh, every cockpit out here is a little sun trap, all of your very own. And when the, when the canopy comes down, it's just a little greenhouse. It's great.
And Perry, can you just confirm again you're going for a hot FRA on target 12? Negative, uh, hot FRA on target 2, uh, level and shallow dive on target 2 and straight on target 12. Roger, copy, thanks sir. From high altitude, the range can clearly be seen and the pilots prepare for a series of bombing and strafing runs monitored from a tower by the RSO, the range safety officer. Okay, call me leaving the IT, you will be clear for an FRA. Okay, and uh, Paris is now leaving the IT. Roger, okay, Paris. And Paris 1, you're clear hot. One, your score was a bullseye. One. Good start. <laughs> Three down wind. Shortly after rolling out, after pointing at the target, the pilot will begin fine-tuning the aircraft's weapon delivery system. Firstly, the aircraft is manoeuvred to place the bomb fall line, the line running from top to bottom of the display, through the target. The pilot One then eight. takes control of and moves the target bar, the much shorter horizontal line seen here next to the letter R. This is achieved using the hand controller, moved or ackled by the pilot's left thumb. In theory, the bomb will now impact at the point on the ground directly behind the intersection of these two lines. Also displayed in the HUD are top left, the aircraft's speed, top right, the aircraft's height, and down at the base of the display, the aircraft's heading. Down the left-hand side is an alpha display, the aircraft's angle of attack. Down the right-hand side, the vertical speed indicator, giving an accurate indication of the aircraft's rate of either climb or descent. Three, your score was a bullseye. your score was a bullseye. <laughs> score With regards to serviceability, we've been pretty lucky overall this week, though we have hit a couple of bad patches where our one trade group particularly has had to work very hard. And the difficulty there is it's been the armament engineers. They're the ones that are working hard routinely anyway because of the nature of our detachment down here. And additionally, some of the aircraft snags that we've had have been armament related. So the same small pool of specialists have had to do all the hard work.
I think a lot of people are very well aware how useful the exercise is to the air crew simply because they manage to do the things that they need to do should they ever have to go and use the kit operationally. But also it's of great value to the ground crew because we tend to come away as a formed unit and we get used to working together as a formed unit and encountering the sort of problems that you would encounter deployed on operations, such as the problems with resupply, using other people's toolkits, uh, making do in many respects, and it's very much a first-line perspective. So they need to come away on a regular basis and be involved in this sort of detachment. I mean, I think I'm particularly lucky being uh, invited in to stand in for the Django while he's taking a bit of leave, so I've had a great time. I thoroughly enjoyed myself and it's enabled me to get my hand in on first line again. It's a good time all in all. Difficult to sum it up in, uh, in one go really. It's been, uh, it's been very enjoyable from the word go. There have been, there have been periods of frustration where I've perhaps wanted to, uh, to get on and, and, and gain qualifications and and it hasn't been uh, hasn't been available, but uh, but it all swings and roundabouts. One stage you feel like you're being held back, and then the next the next time you look round, you've suddenly you know you become a pairs leader, you're a tiled combat ready, and and suddenly things have start started to pick up pace again. So overall, it's been it's been fantastic, and I've been to about ten different countries and flown around in those countries and 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 had a great time.